So good afternoon and welcome to the Ag Lunch and Learn presented by the University of Florida IFAS Extension in both DeSoto and Sarasota counties. My name is Caitlin Molinix and I am the 4-H agent in DeSoto County. Um, today I will be your moderator as we learn about the power of plants and citrus. Uh, we are also joined today by a team of agents and staff and if each of you will take a moment to go ahead and introduce yourselves. So first we'll go ahead and start with Ms. Sarah Davis. Um, hi, I'm uh, Sarah Davis and I am the 4-H agent in Sarasota County and looking forward to hearing about plants and citrus today. So we'll go straight down the line. So Ms. Kelly, if you don't mind telling us who you are. Hi, I'm Kelly Dietz. I'm the Sarasota County 4-H program assistant. And Ms. Juliana, if you'll go ahead and share with us as well. Hi, I'm Juliana Costanzo. I'm the 4-H Youth Development Intern, and I'm very excited to share with you four facts about plants a little bit later. So today, just take note that this workshop is being recorded and it may be used for future educational programming. You and your parent or guardian completed a waiver consenting to the recording. And if you have any concerns with being recorded or do not wish to be recorded, please be sure to keep your camera off and your audio muted. So today we're gonna to go ahead and start our presentation first with reciting both the American and the 4-H pledge. So if you'll please stand and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, and to the Republic, Ooh. One nation under. <laughs> I'm sorry, guys. Um, okay, so that was kind of a goof. I apologize. <laughs> no problem. Um, do you want me to recite it again? Yes. Okay. Yeah, so, or could we actually, sorry, this is going to take editing, but should we have our 4-H member say it, or do we just go ahead and say it? We can go ahead and say it. Kinsley okay. can say it with us if she wants to. Okay. So I pledge allegiance, allegiance to, to the, the flag, flag of the United, United States, States of America. America. And to the republic, the republic for, which for which it stands. One nation. One nation. Under God. Under God indivisible, indivisible. With liberty and justice, justice for all. Next, we'll go ahead and say our 4-H pledge. Just follow with me. So I pledge my head to clear, head clear thinking. thinking. My, my heart to greater loyalty, my, my hands to larger service, service, my health, health to better living, for my for club, my club my community, my country, my country, and my world. Thank you. You may be seated. So today we are going to be joined by two presenters. Um, our first presenter is Dr. Marguerite Beckford. Um, who is a commercial horticulture agent in Sarasota County. Um, and she will be sharing today about plant power. Uh, so Dr. Marguerite, we're very excited to have you on today to share about plants. And before I turn it over, if you can please um, open up a new browser and if you will visit minty.com and I will put it right in front of you so that you can go ahead and see the website. So if you will go to minty.com and enter the code 760105, Dr. Marguerite would like to know what did you have for breakfast today? So take just a minute or two and go ahead and enter what you ate for breakfast. Very good. So we'll go ahead and continue on. So if you didn't get a chance to add um, what you've had for breakfast, that's okay. You'll still be able to add it. But I'm going to go ahead and turn the screen over doc to Dr. Marguerite and let her um, kick off her plant power presentation. Thank you, Miss Caitlin. I'm happy to be here. I'm happy to talk about plants. I am the commercial horticulture extension agent in Sarasota County. And so as you can guess, my life is all about plants and I'm so happy to be here to share with you 
the power of plants. I always tell people when I'm doing a presentation, I turn my video off because I get really distracted. It, to me, it's like talking to yourself in the mirror. And I don't know who likes to do that, but I don't. So I usually turn my video off. So once I start my screen share, you won't be able to see me, but I'm still here, have no fear. So now I'm gonna start my presentation on the power of plants. Okay, so this presentation is called Plant Power, the hidden role of plants in our daily lives and how our survival depends on plants. So I had Miss Caitlin ask everyone what they ate for breakfast this morning because pretty much unless you had nothing, <laughs> like some people, if you had anything for breakfast, it was probably based on plant power. Um, so if you look at that map there, that, that just gives you an overview of food crops grown in the United States by state, um, based on our Mentimeter, I would say that most of what we consumed was based on some kind of plant that was grown in the United States. With the exception of tea, and I like tea myself, but um, the United States is not a huge tea producer. Most of our tea comes from India. Um, some of it comes from China as well. Um, but anything else, like your granola, the ingredients for granola are oats, and I know that oats aren't represented on this map because even though oats are grown in the United States, this is just a representative uh, representation of the most um, economically important crop in each state. And so we know that we grow more than oranges in Florida, but um, Florida is represented on this map for having citrus as its most um, prominent economic product. So what I would like you to do as part of this activity is um, many, many people will eat bagels, pancakes, waffles, or even um, toast for breakfast. So I'd like you in the chat box to type in which state is responsible for growing one of the primary ingredients in waffles, bagels, and toast. So click on your chat box and type in which state is responsible for growing the primary ingredient in waffles, pancakes, toast. And this should be a really easy one for you guys. If you remember, and I see Kingsley like, mm. so the first thing you have to do is figure out what is the primary ingredient in waffles or toast or bagels or pancakes. And it begins with a W. And then the second thing you have to figure out is what state or states are the primary producers for that ingredient in waffles and pancakes that begins with a W. So let me look in a chat box and see if I, ha if I see, yes, keep coming, put your presentation, put your um, information in. So let me see, good, I see some answers, Illinois, Texas, South Dakota, Virginia, good. And if you haven't yet figured out what that primary ingredient is, I want somebody to type that into the chat box as well. What is the, one of the primary ingredients in bagels, pancakes, waffles, toast? Beginning with a W. I'm not gonna give it away. Great, good. I'm not gonna give it away because I know it's being recorded and I want you guys 
if you're watching this recording to figure it out. So I see some answers in the chat box and yes, you guys are right. All right, so my next question for you is there are many people who will have hash browns for breakfast. What state or states are responsible for growing the primary ingredient in hash browns? So again, you have to do two things. You have to figure out what's the primary ingredient in hash brown, in hash browns, and type that into the chat box. I'm not going to give it away, but a, um, a clue is it begins with P. And then you have to figure out which state or states are the primary producers of that ingredient in hash browns. So I'm going to give you a few minutes to type that into the chat box. And again, I'm not going to give away the answer because this is being recorded and I don't want to um, give it away for those watching the recording. Okay, good. So I see some people typing in Wisconsin. But again, you guys have to figure out what primary ingredient we're talking about. Yes, I see some people typing in Idaho. Great. Awesome. And we did make it a little challenging for you by not putting in the names of the state. So you kind of have to also do some digging like, what state is that? I know that. I know that state. Okay. All right. So the next question I have for you is there are some people who will eat cereal for breakfast. So any of your, your cereals like your honeycomb, your pops, your frosted flakes, um, there's a primary ingredient in those cereals that begin with C. I want you to type in the chat box what state or states are responsible for growing that primary ingredient for honeycomb, Kellogg's Pops, or Frosted Flakes. And the primary ingredient begins with a C. And I'm going to warn you, this is a little bit of a trick question, <laughs> but I want to see what your answers are. So type it in. The question is, what states or states are responsible for growing the primary ingredient in many cereals, including Frosted Flakes, Honeycomb, and Kellogg's Pops? And that primary ingredient begins with the letter C. All right, so I told you it was a trick question because if you look at your map, you will see, and I'm going to have to give it away just a little bit. You will, you will see that on this side of your map, it will say that there are some states that are responsible for growing sweet corn. The reason I said it's a trick question is that sweet corn and the corn you get in your cereal are not the same crop. That's why I said it was a trick question. So I have a green circle here, which highlights the states that are the primary grain corn producers in the US. And so grain corn produced in this green circle is actually different from sweet corn, which you'll see produced over here. Um, sweet corn is the kind of corn you'll eat when you eat corn on the cob, or even um, corn that we would put, say, in you know um, a stew or even a pot pie. And your grain corn is grown to turn it into cereal, either cereal that people eat or um, grain feed that we feed to animals. And so the grain corn that's grown for cereal or animal feed is produced mostly by Iowa and Illinois, along with uh, Indiana, Kentucky, Ohio, South Dakota, South Dakota and Nebraska. So that was just a little bit of a trick question, but uh, I just wanted you guys to realize that there's a difference between sweet corn and cereal corn. All right. So there was one person I think who put in on the Mentimeter chat that they had eggs for breakfast. And even though eggs are not from plants, the animals that we get eggs from rely on plants. 
And so here we go. Here is the map of the states that produce that are livestock product producing. Either they produce beef or pork or milk or chicken or eggs. And so my next question is, if you did have cereal for breakfast, what state or states do um, milk come from? And so type that into your chat box. I wanna see if you can remember your state maps. Okay, so I see some people putting in Michigan, good. Keep going, guys. I want to know what states are, are responsible for producing the milk that you would have had with your cereal. Great. Keep going. Awesome. Now, we all know that milk is not a plant, but the animals that produce the milk what do those animals eat? So I want you to type that into your chat box as well. What do the animals that produce milk eat? Awesome. So I'm seeing grass. I'm seeing grains. Good. Good job. So grass and grains are plants. So the milk that you had with your cereal was brought to you by plant power. Um, one person typed in this Mentimeter eggs. Um, chickens are also fed grains. And so your eggs that you had for breakfast were brought to you by plant power. If you had bacon for breakfast, the bacon was brought to you by plant power. And um, Speaking of bacon, I want you to type into your chat box the states. Yes, somebody said um, animals eat hay, um, cattle eat hay. Good. I want you to type into your chat box the state or states that are responsible for bacon production. Good, I see some people saying North Carolina, great, keep going. And I know it takes you a little bit longer because you have to try to remember your state names, but um, we did want to make it just a little challenging for you so you your brain had to do a little bit of work. So in addition to plant power, you also had to use brain power. Awesome, I see Ohio, I see Iowa. Great. Good job. Um, this, the participation is just really great. Okay, so this map just basically shows you that it doesn't matter what you had for breakfast, it was brought to you by plant power. And I know you might be wondering, seafood, nobody has seafood for breakfast, but I am going to talk about seafood um, and how seafood is brought to you by plant power. I saw someone else enter into the chat box, Illinois, great. And it's okay if you have to get your phone and pull up your state maps because we don't always remember. Um, obviously, I remember where Florida is and California, but we don't always remember where, what the names of the other states. Um, Texas is pretty familiar because it's like the, one of the largest states, but it's okay if you need to pull up your phone and try to remember what states um, where the states are located, that's totally fine, okay? And so here is just a refresher of where the states are located, um, just in case you couldn't remember what that one state up in the corner is, okay? All right, so now, now let's continue talking about plant power. I did promise you that I would tell you about seafood and how seafood is brought to you by plant power. So if you type in your chat box some of the favorite, some of your favorite seafood items, I like salmon. Um, but I want you to type in the chat box some of your sea favorite seafood items and I will tell you how that item was 
brought to you by the power of plants. So I'm gonna give you just a few moments to type in the chat box some of your favorite seafood items because we covered um, plant items, crop items, and we covered livestock items, but we didn't cover seafood. Okay, I see people say fish and shrimp. All right, good. Some people might put in lobster. Yes, I see lobster as well. All right, so now let me tell you how your lobster was brought to you by Plant Power. There are many animals in aquatic environments, whether they live in the ocean or they live in the river, they will feed on other animals. But the smallest animal that's part of the food chain in your seafood chain or even your um, aquatic environment chain, the smallest animal is um, in a category called zooplankton. And this word zoo means animal related. So zooplankton is a microscopic aquatic organism, but the zooplankton feed on phytoplankton. Whenever you see the word phyto, it means plants. And so any animal that you have harvested from the sea is dependent on phytoplankton. Even if that animal eats other animals, so say your lobster might eat zooplankton, if there was no phytoplankton, which is a plant-based organism that has chlorophyll, and the chlorophyll allows it to photosynthesize way, way, way down at the bottom of a water body, as long as it has access to sunlight, the phytoplankton can photosynthesize. So if your lobster ate some tiny shrimp, those tiny shrimp ate some zooplankton, but the zooplankton feed on phytoplankton. And so your largest lobster is dependent on plants. Your salmon is dependent on plants, your fish, your tuna, all of the animals we harvest from the sea are dependent on plant power that is used to keep the phytoplankton alive. And so, like I said, I promised you that everything we eat, no matter what it is, is based on plant power. Um, and you can trace all your marine life, your aquatic life to the power in, of plants in your phytoplankton. Okay, so I don't know about you, but I could not survive on sunshine for breakfast, but that's exactly what plants do. Your phytoplankton, it has sunshine for breakfast. All your plants have sunshine for breakfast. So any organism that has chlorophyll in it, and chlorophyll is a substance that makes those organisms green. Chlorophyll is what makes leaves green. Chlorophyll is what makes phytoplankton green. Any organism that has chlorophyll in it has sunshine for breakfast. And what I mean by that is it uses the sunshine power, which is solar power, to split carbon dioxide, carbon dioxide is in our environment and plants will take up water or phytoplankton has access to water. So anything with chlorophyll will take sunshine and it will use the power of sunshine to split carbon dioxide and water, split those two molecules. Once they split the molecules, they will recombine the molecules into carbohydrates and sugars and then the byproduct is water and oxygen. So anything with chlorophyll will go through this entire process that we call photosynthesis. And so really what plants do is plants have sunshine for breakfast. That's what they have for breakfast. They don't eat food like you and I do. They take in the sunshine and they combine it with carbon. They use the sunshine and they will split your carbon dioxide that we breathe out and they will split water and they will convert that into carbohydrates. And so Miss Asia is gonna talk about orange juice in a bit, but the carbohydrates in orange juice, the carbohydrates in your corn, your wheat, your um, berries, your watermelon, you name it, your favorite fruit, um, rice, even the tea that I saw somebody put into drink. When we drink tea, when we drink tea that's made from tea leaves, the leaves are actually made up of carbohydrates that the plant 
has used sunshine power to um, convert carbon dioxide and water into. And so plants have sunshine for breakfast. And because they have sunshine for breakfast, they create the foods that we rely on um, in our daily lives. But it's not just food that plants produce that we rely on. There's also hidden plant power in the plants that we sit on. So here is lumber. Again, the process of photosynthesis that I just described to you, the plants will take sunshine and they will combine carbon dioxide and water and convert it into the carbohydrates that are used to make up timber or wood. And so this picture is actually showing you the hidden power of plants because we, anything you're sitting on, once it's made of wood, is based on plant power. Hidden power of plants, again, plants we live in. You might not think that you live in a tree house, but the roof that's covering you is made from plants. And so we do, there, there are a large part of the shelter, shelters we live in are brought to us by plant power. And again, here you'll see the lumber, the leaves will photosynthesize and turn the carbon dioxide and water into carbohydrates and these carbohydrates are stored in molecules that make up um, lumber and wood. So our house, our roofs are bought, brought to us by plant power. If we live in a wooden house, our houses are brought to us by plant power. Okay, so the paper that you use every day, the books you read every day are brought to you by plant power. And so on the right, you'll see um, a picture of a paper mill. That's how they actually make paper. They make them in giant reams and then they'll cut them into different sizes to make books or writing paper or um, you know, sketching paper, all sorts of paper. But paper is brought to us by plants. What they'll do is they'll actually have um, farms, tree farms that they grow trees that they will then harvest. They will take the wood and they will process the wood in a paper mill and produce paper. So your paper, your books are brought to you by plant power. So plants you use every day, your paper towels, your bathroom tissue, the paper cups you drink out of, the paper plates you eat off, the paper napkins, the tissues you use to blow your nose, these are all brought to you by plant power. And these are just some examples of plants that you use every day. Now, I'm sure you never thought about this, but there are plants that you plug into every day. The plants that power your phone charger, your iPad charger, your computer charger, your television, all of these um, electric, electronic equipment, um, I should say, these electronic um, items rely on electricity. And there are some electricity plants that use plant power to generate electricity. So again, your lives are powered by plants. So when I said that there are some electricity plants that rely on plant-based power. There are some electricity plants that use coal-based electricity. So they'll burn coal to generate electricity. And so when you plug your, your phone charger into the wall, you're actually plugging into a plant. Um, and so just briefly, because I don't want to go over time, just briefly, this is a diagram of how coal is formed. So you might know that coal is mined from deep underground. But the coal actually got there from millions of years of dead plants when the plant leaves fall to the ground and they decompose and over time the layers of decomposition get buried by more soil eventually heat and pressure will turn the dead plants that have fallen below ground 
into coal. And then once coal is mined and it goes to electricity plants, that coal is burned to generate electricity. So you can tell um, your friends that you are plugging into plants when you plug in your charger. Now, not every single electricity plant uses coal um, to generate electricity, but many of them do. And you can do your own homework to find out which um, the source of your electricity, which power plant you get your electricity from, and whether it uses coal or a different kind of energy. Okay, so plants which keep you cool. Here we have our puppy and he's being cooled off by a fan. And this fan is based, um, this fan relies on electricity to keep our puppy cool. So right now it's plant power that's cooling our puppy. Likewise with your AC units, if you're using um, an el electricity from a coal-based plant, you're relying on plants to keep you cool. Likewise here on the right, after you're done playing basketball on a nice hot summer day, you go on in under the shade of a tree and the shade of that tree will keep you cool. So plants keep you cool, but plants also can keep you warm. So if it is a chilly winter day and you have a wood burning stove in your house, the wood from the plants will keep you warm. Also, there are many people who like um, pizza from a wood burning stove. And again, you're using the wood as a source of fuel to bake your pizza. So this is just an example of plants which keep you warm. And so I, with that, I'm going to end it here and I'm going to say we should give a huge round of applause to plant power because plant power makes the world go round. And Miss Asia is going to tell you more about citrus. Miss Juliana is going to give you four more amazing facts about um, plants. And I want to thank you for joining me on this talk about plant power. And again, here's my information. And um, I'm going to stop screen sharing and you can type your questions into the chat box. And Miss Juliana has some information to share about amazing facts on plants. All right. Thank you so much, Marguerite. That was awesome. I learned so much about plants and how I use plants to live every day. I have four more amazing facts about plants for you. Okay, number one, plants have superpowers. They have the power to capture sunlight and use it to create their own food using just carbon dioxide and water. This superpower is commonly referred to as photosynthesis. Photo meaning light and synthesis meaning creation. Wow, that's awesome. Number two, all food consumed by humans is dependent on the contribution of plants to the food chain. That's right, without plants, we wouldn't be able to eat anything. Number three, plants are the oldest living organisms on earth. The oldest tree in Florida the oldest tree in Florida was a cypress named the Senator, and it was over 3,500 years old in 2012 when it accidentally burnt down. The oldest tree on the planet is a bristle cone pine located in an undisclosed location in California. It is over 4,700 years old. Holy cow, that is a very old tree. Number four. Plants are among the largest living organisms on earth. The largest tree is the giant pando aspen in Utah, which takes up to 107 acres. Wow, that is a huge tree, 107 acres. Oh my gosh, I can't imagine how big that is. All right, that's it for my four amazing plant facts. Thank you, Juliana. Um, so thank you, Dr. Marguerite, for sharing such wonderful information, and thank you, Juliana, for sharing those four uh, additional amazing plant facts with us. Our next speaker today is Ms. Asia Paolillo, 
Um, and Miss Asia is the multi-county citrus agent, and she will be talking today about the citrus industry. Uh, so thank you for being here with us, Asia, and you can go ahead and take on over the screen share. All right, thank you, Miss Caitlin. Let me go ahead and get my screen here. There we are. Okay. All right. Thank you very much for having me today. Um, as Ms. Caitlin said, um, my name is Asia Payalolo, and I am the multi-county citrus agent, and I actually cover three counties in Florida. I cover DeSoto County, Hardy County, and Manatee County. And I'm going to be talking to you today about citrus in Florida and some of the amazing things that citrus brings to our lives here in the state. How did citrus, our citrus industry begin? So citrus, um, surprisingly, is not native to Florida. Citrus is thought to originally um, come from the continent of Asia, and it was brought to the New World by Christopher Columbus in 1493. After that, this gentleman right here, Mr. Ponce de Leon, is believed to have planted the first citrus tree up near St. Augustine, which if you don't know where that is, that's up on the east coast of Florida, um, above Daytona Beach, if you know where that is. And that was around the 1500s. So after that, citrus started gaining popularity in Florida. It could be started to found uh, in the wild due to being moved by animals. And then it began to be grown commercially after the Civil War in the late 1800s. Grown commercially means that farmers came in and started producing citrus in groves for our food supply. Back then, the major source of transportation for citrus was the railroad, which enabled Floridians to be able to send their citrus all across the country, which made it great for marketing and, and able to sell their fruit. An interesting fact is that citrus was grown in the northern parts of Florida back then because the weather was different than what we have now. And due to some major devastating freezes, we were forced to have our industry come south. So that's why the majority of our citrus industry now lies in the central region and the southern regions of Florida. So how does citrus grow? So a citrus tree, you might think you can just plant a seed and you'll get a citrus tree. In a way that's true and in a way it's not. Because citrus is very special and it is rather complicated, but you may not get the desired plant that you're wanting when you plant a citrus tree. You, you'll get citrus, but it may not be exactly what it's supposed to be. So over the years, what we've done to make sure that we're getting the varieties and the plants that we want, we've developed a system called grafting. And what that causes is the citrus tree to have two main parts. The first part, the top, is called the scion, and you can see that right here in this diagram. This is the part of the tree that the fruit that you want to eat. So if you like hamlins or grapefruit, that's the type of fruit that we're going to graft onto here. Then you see down here, we have the rootstock. And you can tell right here, this is the graft union. So that's where they're put together. Um, the reason we have that is Number one, like I was explaining with, to have the variety that we want, but also citrus is grown all over the state and we don't have just one type of soil or one type of chemicals in the soil that would cause it to be high in salt or a different pH, which measures the acidity in the soil. So we have different types of rootstocks, which they are also varieties of citrus. Most of them are citrus that is rare, fairly inedible. It, it's got a lot of seeds or it just doesn't really taste very good, but they work excellent in giving us a rootstock. And those different varieties are adapted to different areas of Florida. So something that may grow in Arcadia may not necessarily be okay in Lakeland or on the East Coast where it's high calcium in the soil. So that's given our citrus growers 
the opportunity to grow in different areas and in different conditions. So once the citrus trees, they're, they're grown in a nursery undercover in a greenhouse. And once the citrus trees are out planted in the field, it takes about three to five years before that citrus tree is going to start bearing enough fruit to make a profit for our growers. The citrus trees, they produce blooms in early spring, usually around March. And in DeSoto County, I am sure that you can smell them for miles. They smell so good, the blooms. Um, and they usually last about a month. It starts in March, roughly, uh, depending on the weather. And once the flower petals fall off of the blooms, a small little fruitlet is left. And this will grow into the fruit that we eat. So starting once the petals fall off, throughout the spring, throughout the summer, and into the fall. The fruit grow and mature and get that nice taste with the sugars and the acid and that great balance that it has. And depending on the variety that the citrus is, it will start to be harvested in September and our harvest season goes all the way through June. Again, depending on how the fruit matures and the different standards of maturity that are measured by the state to tell if the orange juice is, is at the right time to, to pick it. Um, some varieties you've noticed probably are seedless and some have many seeds. So it just depends on the variety. Um, we tend to have a lot of seedless fruit now, but you can certainly find different fruits that have a lot of seeds as well. So how does citrus grow? So, we grow them in groves, they're called, and they're grown in rows, and that allows a good way of taking care of the trees. They're able, the grower is able to run a tractor through the tree, through the groves in the drive middles, and able to, down here you can see where they spray. They spray anything from nutritional products to help the tree grow, to any kind of chemicals that they need to control pests and diseases that are in the grove. Here you can see this is a microjet sprinkler, and I want you to remember that for later for one of my amazing facts, okay? So this little sprinkler has really helped our growers to give the trees the irrigation that they need, but also helping us to conserve water, which is great. So it was a great invention for our groves. And this little sprinkler stays up under the canopy of the tree. So how is citrus used? So some citrus fruits are used for juice while some are delivered to your grocery store for you to eat fresh. So over here, I believe these are, are mandarins, tangerine type fruit here. And so you would notice that a lot and have that as a fresh fruit, a fresh variety that you would peel yourself and be able to take apart the segments and eat those. We also have fresh varieties grown with grapefruit and other orange varieties as well. Most of the fruit that's grown in Florida is used for juice. So that is the majority of our, our fruit. And the varieties, the main varieties that we grow here for juice are gonna be Hamlin's and Valencia's. And interestingly enough, Hamlin's are our early varieties. So they get start getting harvested early in the season and our Valencia's are our late varieties. So we have, and in between, we have a few other varieties that we use. So we have, are getting juice all harvest season long for our, for our juice plants. Some of the varieties that are grown for the fresh market include navel oranges, tangerines, and grapefruits. This is a couple of pictures of some citrus harvesting, and I kind of wanted to explain a few things to you here um, because I want you to, next time when, when our harvest season comes around and you see a fruit truck go down the road, I want you to know exactly where that fruit truck's going to be going. So here's a harvester. He's up on the ladder. Um, these bags that they pick, these bags can hold up to 90 pounds of fruit when they're picking them, so they can be very heavy if you can imagine going up and down that ladder. This box here, this white box, it's square. When you see a truck going down the road with a bunch of these white boxes, that means it's going to a packing house to be packed for fresh fruit, okay? This middle, this middle picture here, that is an example of juice fruit. 
they have a different tub in the field, which I didn't have a picture of, I'm sorry, but it's, it's like a, a large round tub. And what they do is they dump that into the large trucks and it goes into another truck to go into the juice plant. So if you're seeing a truck go down the road that is just filled with oranges, it just is one big box filled with oranges, that truck is going to the juice plant. And this here is a picture of a juice plant with a bunch of loads of trucks. So these are actually the tops of trucks that are filled with fruit waiting to be juiced in the juice plant. Citrus byproducts. Okay, so we know we peel the, or we process the fruit, which you can see here, this is an example of a juicing machine. It's very fast. They do a lot of fruit every minute. And all of this here, this is all the pulp and peel and squished peel that was taken out and the juice got taken away through a pipe. So byproducts are products that are made from citrus after the fruit has been processed. So we try hard not to have any of the fruit go to waste when we have citrus. So unused pulp and peel are used to make cattle feed and oil from the peel are used in cleaning products and air fresheners like sprays and candles. So if you ever have something that has an orange scent to it, most likely it has real orange oil in it or orange essence and that's what makes it smell so good. And in cleaning products, Oils from citrus are very good at getting through grease and dirt and grime, and that's why they're in a lot of cleaning products. Some of the insects that we deal with in citrus, some of them are kind of just a nuisance. They, they eat the leaves a little bit, but then we've got some, some insects that can really be bothersome to, to our industry. First is over here, this is the juvenile or nymph stage of the Asian citrus psyllid. And as you may or may not know, the Asian citrus psyllid transmits the bacteria that causes citrus greening or HLB. Now that's the disease that we're dealing with the most right now. And it's been very devastating to our industry. And so we we had the insect, but whenever we got the bacteria, that's when it started to spread. And so our growers are working hard to try to control the insect as well as to help the tree along while it's dealing with this disease. This here in the middle, this is called a leaf miner, and this is the larval stage of the leaf miner. It grows into a small little moth. Um, but the interesting thing about this is it actually tunnels its way through the layers of the leaf, which is why they call it like it's mining in the leaf. And I'll talk about this in a second when I talk about citrus canker. This actually produces a wound on the leaf. And too many of these leaf miners making these tunnels on the leaf will cause it to curl and that will prevent it from photosynthesizing from Dr. Marguerite's um, talk, it will cause it to not photosynthesize as well as it should. So that can also harm the tree. Down here, we have some damage from what's called rust mites, and they are very small. You cannot see them with just your eye. You need a very strong hand lens or a microscope to see them. Um, you know that they're there, by it creates this purplish type blemish on the fruit. But luckily, it does not harm our fruit, so it tastes just as good even if the rust mite is on there. As I talked about, this is citrus greening. So I've got two pictures here showing what that is. You get this, this discoloration in the fruit or in the leaves, I'm sorry, and it causes the trees to become very health, unhealthy and then the trees will ultimately die. So the grower usually will pull the tree out before that happens because the tree becomes very unproductive and unfortunately we don't get much fruit off of it. You can see here the fruit can be very small, it's lopsided and misshapen, and the sugars and the acids, they just don't produce very well, they don't develop correctly, and so the fruit quality does get affected. So we have had some fruit that tastes more acidic than it, than it normally would have. Down here is citrus canker. Now this is a little bit different disease. It is a bacterial disease as well, but this one kind of more affects just the way it looks. 
It does make the tree sick in a way that these lesions, again, like the leaf miner, it will cause it not to photosynthesize as well because the lesions are there and they're, they're covering the leaf surface and it is putting some stress on the tree. Um, but for the most part, it does not affect the, the fruit quality. So if the fruit is bound for a juice plant, it's usually not too much of an issue. We do try to control it the best we can. The problem lies when the fruit is bound for fresh market because everybody wants a, a nice looking fruit. Um, we don't want to have these blemishes on there. So unfortunately with the blemishes, even though it doesn't harm the quality of the fruit, it will make the fruit unmarketable to some and we cannot ship it over to other countries. And that's a big problem for our grapefruit growers who are over on the East Coast. They export a lot of fruit over to Europe and China. Okay, so my first amazing fact about citrus. We haven't had a freeze in a while, thank goodness, um, but growers use ice to protect citrus in Florida from freezing temperatures. How might that work, you ask? Well, citrus trees and fruit can be severely damaged by freezing temperatures if the temperature is low enough for a certain amount of hours. Remember the microjet irrigation I told you about? So you've got this small little sprinkler up underneath the tree, right? And they run that irrigation all night long through the freeze. It creates this ice on the, fr on the fruit and on the tree, on the branches and on the trunk. And what that does is it acts as an insulation and it keeps, because we know that water freezes at 32 degrees, right? So with this ice on here, the fruit and branches and, and trunk, it helps keep those parts of the tree at 32 degrees. Whenever a tree reaches 27 degrees, that's when we start having really bad problems. But if we can keep it at this, it tends to help it much better. So that's why we use the, the micro sprinklers. And that's been another great um, benefit from that irrigation type to help us through those freeze nights. Okay, here's another amazing fact about citrus. So if you've ever looked and seen these little now this, this leaf is turned upright, so it could be turned this way and the, and the eggs could be on the bottom side of the leaf. But if you ever had seen that, that's called eggs of the lacewing. And this is the adult insect over here. These eggs, this, this species of insect is very beneficial. The larval stage, which is right here, eats other insects that can harm citrus. So they can eat aphids, they can eat mealybugs. So these are a beneficial insect. So please, please be very careful if you ever see them, but they are super neat to look at whenever you find them. And I've found them on sticks, branches, screens. They're, they're kind of all over the place. These caterpillars are quite odd looking and they're called orange dogs. Um, they do feed on citrus leaves, so if we have ever a heavy infestation, the grower will have to react and, and probably do something. But normally, unless it's a small, young tree, um, they're out there in the citrus groves, and then they turn into this beautiful, giant swallowtail butterfly. So we want to we wanna preserve them, too, as much as we can, if possible. My third fact is when I was talking about the Asian citrus psyllid and that it transmits the bacteria which causes citrus greening. If you've ever looked out and you've seen some young trees in a grove, you'll see bags sometimes, these white bags. You may wonder why is a tree in a bag? Well, the bag is made of a very tight mesh screen and it's tight enough to where this little guy, he looks big in this picture, but he's not very big. Um, cannot fit through the mesh of that screen and meaning they cannot land on the tree, lay eggs and infect the tree with the bacteria. So this tree gives or this bag gives the tree the best chance it can have for the few years that while it's growing and getting established in the field. We want the tree to grow and have a good root system and unfortunately 
whenever it gets infected with citrus greening, the roots are the first thing that get um, that start to die back and they don't grow well. And that's why the trees get unhealthy. They can't transmit the sugars and water up and down the tree and throughout the tree the way they should. Okay, that's all I have. Um, thank you very much. If anybody has any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. I have a quick question. Yes, ma'am. Uh, many of our youth grow plants for our county fair. If someone wanted to grow citrus, um, is it, or what's the best citrus to grow maybe in a potting situation? Well, um, Caitlin can help me answer this question because she has done this for a while. Um, but really you can, you know, and, and I'll let her explain it for sure, but you can grow just about any citrus in a pot um, for the length of time that you're gonna need it for the, for the fair show. Yeah, so really great question. Um, we here in DeSoto County have a great uh, citrus club that was established prior to me arriving and they have grown various varieties. They've grown different lemons. Um, this year we have a uh, sweet fell, which is a tangerine variety. Um, so really their 4-H projects, if they're doing the citrus trees, we try to keep them potted under a year. And we have found that if they keep them in a large enough pot and we put them in 15 gallon pots here in our county, um, we haven't seen too many of those trees that have gotten root bound where they're not able to be planted and grow well in the ground. Um, so uh, a couple other varieties, I know that they have done, done the Myers lemon. Um, we had a pond can last year. We had a dwarf ruby red grapefruit. So definitely multiple varieties that you can choose from. Um, and just watch for that plant to get root bound or run out of room in the pot that it is living in um, to make sure that it has adequate nutrients to keep surviving. Thank you. There was one question in the chat window. How many varieties of citrus are there? Many, many varieties. Um, we grow a lot here, but there, there are many, many different varieties. But the, there's probably, I would say, maybe 10 to 15 main varieties that we would grow in Florida, and that would include, you know, and it, it may be even close to 20 with the specialty fruit, the tangerines, uh, the grapefruit, the round oranges like the Valencias and Hamlins, and also lemons and limes. Any other questions that we might have? So learning about that citrus sure does make me want to go grab a glass of fresh Florida orange juice. I don't know about y'all. Um, Absolutely. But we are so glad that you guys decided to join us today. Um, if there are no more questions, we will go ahead and dismiss. But before we do so, um, I hope that you'll join in tomorrow again at 1230. We will be joined by John Court from the Florida Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services Animal Industry. Um, and we will dive into some disaster preparedness as we are looking into the coming hurricane season or the hurricane season that we're in right now. So we hope that you'll join us again tomorrow afternoon. Um, and we will be using the same Zoom link that you received in your email. And I will be sure to send that to you again tomorrow morning. That way you don't have to search for it. So thank you again for joining us today. Um, and we hope to see you again tomorrow afternoon. Thank you, Asia, as well for presenting today.